welcome ALI members and project participants. We're very sorry we won't see you this year and we hope to see you soon. In the meantime, we have draft materials on the website and we'd like to introduce some of them to you right now and we look forward uh, to your comments. So first, let me talk a little bit about the project in general. We started work in 2014 and we've had five meetings with the advisors and NCG group, uh, the most recent uh, being September 2019. We've been to the council twice, and this is our first time uh, for the membership whenever that meeting actually takes place. So I'm the reporter, uh, and re uh, the associate reporters are Molly Brady, Sarah Bronin, Wilson Firemuth, John Goldberg, Dan Kelly, Brian Lee, Tom Merrill, Chris Newman. And so uh, th today, because of the materials, uh, John, Tom, and Chris will be also speaking with you. So the first uh, question is, what is this? Uh, this is our first time here. Uh, and uh, property might sound very familiar, and it's certainly a, a big part of life. Uh, but what is uh, property for the purposes of a restatement? Well, in its most general uh, guise, it, I guess you would say that property is uh, that part of the law that governs the relationship between persons with respect to resources. Now, that covers a lot of territory. and. Uh, a lot of the resources that we're talking about are conceptualized as things, and the question is, what does that mean? And uh, how does that work? And how does it not work in some cases? Uh, so that brings up the question of how much to cover. Now, property covers a lot of ground. Uh, it's real or personal, tangible or intangible. And property has both uh, private and public aspects, so between persons and between persons in the state. So again, this covers a, a great deal of ground, uh, and we're not uh, trying to do everything in the, in the sense of every last uh, part of the law that's relevant to property. And in particular, we plan to defer to other projects uh, in areas like IP and trust that are highly specialized or sufficiently different from uh, the rest of property. Uh, so current and future projects in those areas will be uh, highly relevant to us, and we plan to do what it, uh, what's necessary to hook up to those projects rather than trying to uh, preempt them or replicate what they do. So the next question is why now? Why a fourth restatement of property? Uh, well, one reason is that property has never been comprehensively restated, which is sometimes uh, a surprise to people because property was restated along with the first generation of uh, subjects uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. So the first restatement uh, was uh, very detailed in many respects, but it, uh, it never covered all of the areas that were planned. Uh, it left a lot of uh, areas out, uh, personal property, adverse possession, land records, and so forth. And so uh, that's uh, out there in the background. And then the second and third restatements covered many uh, areas, uh, selected areas uh, in great depth. Uh, but the ambition was not to uh, cover all of property. It was uh, self-consciously an effort to uh, restate sometimes uh, for the second time or sometimes for the first time selected areas uh, and uh, um, got into great detail on those but left many uh, out. So we're going to try to be comprehensive, but again, not try to do everything. So what are the advantages of trying to do a, a, a comprehensive restatement in this sense? Well, the as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, we get to do certain things for the first time. So personal property is certainly one of them, and that includes bailments, which you'll hear about from Chris uh, very soon. Uh, it also includes adverse possession, which we will be taking uh, to the membership in a future uh, time, uh, land use likewise, and also uh, land records, and many, many more areas are not ones that have been uh, touched in any of the first three uh, restatements. The other reason to be comprehensive is that uh, we can draw out what ties the subject together in a way that wasn't possible in uh, the previous restatements for one reason or another. And uh, that means that uh, we're looking for connections, but we're not forcing connections. We're trying to see to what extent there's a, a system in property and how it functions, why it's there, why it's helpful for people to have it, and also where we don't have that, uh, where there is not system, where there aren't connections, where property just doesn't work that way. So what we're, we're looking for is system, but not in a sort of deductive, uh, super formalistic uh, sense. So what about the materials that we have uh, for you on the, the site and that we hope to discuss with you uh, before too long? Well, first is the table of contents. This being the first time that we're here, 
uh, we uh, want to give you an overall vision of the project. And uh, I think that will give you a very good sense of what we uh, aim to do. Uh, you'll notice if you look at the table of contents that we uh, have a wide variety of levels of detail in the various parts of the uh, table of contents. And the reason for that is that we've been at this for a while and we have done some work on some of these areas. And we thought it would be artificial to withhold our ideas on the, the detailed table of contents from those areas. Uh, and so that's why there's this, uh, this mismatch. Uh, we didn't think that uh, there was any reason not to show that, but uh, there, of course, in the end of the project, everything will be uh, down to the same level of detail. The second thing I'd like to point out about the materials is that we have a theme this time. Uh, the theme that ties together the various areas that we're going to be uh, presenting, uh, which are possession, trespass, uh, uh, trespass to real property, and bailments, is the notion of possession itself. And one reason we thought this would be a great theme to begin our uh, presentations uh, to you uh, with would be that possession is, in some sense, emblematic of the approach we're taking. Uh, so what we are looking for is how to define the concept and uh, make it useful, uh, but not to look for some magic legal formula that will solve all problems and uh, will capture all aspects of possession, uh, maybe even the uses of the word possession, especially to cover uh, notions of possession out there in the world that arise from custom or social norms. So again, uh, as with some area, other areas of the law, we're going to uh, restate the law, but try to hook up to social conventions, social norms, customs out there in the world without trying to restate them and try to do everything at all at once and wind up being uh, either too uh, cumbersome and inaccurate or uh, on one hand or vague on the other. So again, possession is a theme here and it's also a way of uh, introducing the project uh, as a whole. And with that, uh, let me introduce Tom Merrill. Thank you, Henry. Um, uh, as Henry mentioned, possession is a uh, sort of integrative concept. It's sort of uh, all over the place in the law of property, so it's critical that we have uh, sections uh, uh, covering it in the restatement uh, fourth. Um, uh, just to give you a few examples of where possession uh, makes its appearance, uh, You'll all remember from uh, law school, first year law school, the Fox case and so forth, that possession is a basis for establishing ownership of certain unowned, unclaimed, or abandoned resources. It's also critical in doctrines of adverse possession and prescription. Uh, it plays a pivotal role in determining uh, the validity of a gift or a deed that has to be delivered. Therefore, that means possession has to be transferred. Um, it establishes quite critically uh, standing to sue under uh, what can be called property torts. We're going to talk about trespass today, uh, which is uh, re it requires that the person be in possession of the land in order to bring a trespass action. It's also true of nuisance. It's true of conversion uh, and so forth. So um, possession is, uh, is vital uh, in those uh, respects. It's also uh, very important in establishing uh, leases uh, or bailments. We'll talk about bailments uh, later. And uh, in, in both cases of leases and bailments, uh, possession uh, of something is transferred from uh, one party to another. So possession is obviously, and that, that does not begin to exhaust the areas in which possession uh, pops up. Uh, as Henry mentioned, our strategy here is not to be dogmatic and try to come up with some kind of one-size-fits-all definition of possession, uh, nor do we uh, fall into what I think is a trap of treating it as a simple fact. Courts, I think, frequently just assume that possession is a kind of, state of statement of fact about the world, uh, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, and our solution, or our attempted solution at least, is to come up with a general definition, but to be cautious uh, that the definition will apply differently in different contexts depending on the factual circumstances and depending on social norms that happen to apply uh, in any particular context in, uh, in developing an understanding of what possession means. Uh, the basic definition is set out in section 1.1 1 .1, uh, in your materials uh, uh, and it really is quite uh, similar uh, to the definitions that previous restatements have used both in terms of uh, uh, restating particular um, propositions about property, but also uh, about torts, both uh, personal property and, and real property, insofar as it intersects with torts. Um, uh, the definition uh, will 
be edited slightly. We got a very helpful uh, suggestion already that we should move the phrase to the exclusion of others up a little bit in, in the, in the uh, definition so that it now reads, uh, uh, a person has possession of a physical thing if the person has established effective control over the thing to the exclusion of others and manifests an intent to maintain such control. Uh, we don't think this is in any way inconsistent with the intent behind, behind our original uh, the moving the, the phrase. It's, it changes the meaning or the intent, but it's a little clearer, I think. Um, so um, a couple of points to note generally uh, about uh, this uh, approach to possession and this definition. Uh, one is that uh, communication is very important. It's implicit in the idea of establishing control uh, control uh, does not simply mean uh, sort of physically seizing uh, uh, an object and having the ability to fight off everyone else. Uh, it, it's more, much more of a social uh, aspect to it. And of course, the definition also refers to uh, manifesting an intent to maintain control, which much more clearly uh, signals that com communication is an important aspect of what possession means. So uh, uh, we, we lay, lay quite a bit of uh, emphasis um, on the idea that uh, in order to uh, determine that someone is in possession, they have to sort of communicate to the world, the relevant community, uh, uh, both that they've established control and that they intend to maintain that control. Uh, communication, again, is sort of key to social norms. Uh, it's not just simply uh, something that can be understood in a universalistic sense. So for example, uh, as we note in, the, in the, some of the comments, uh, different whaling communities in the 19th century had different ideas about what would establish possession of a whale. Uh, some of them required that the harpoon be connected by a line to the boat. Others required simply that the harpoon kill the whale, uh, and still others required that a certain harpoon had to have a mark or a waif or a flag on it to indicate uh, which boat had uh, killed the whale. So. These were different uh, communities of whalers that uh, hunted different types of whales within the community. Uh, slightly different norms applied as to what would signal establishing control. Uh, that's just a very dramatic illustration of how uh, we think social context and norms uh, play a role in defining uh, possession. The second point to highlight is that uh, different degrees of uh, control are necessary to establish possession as, a, as an original matter. Uh, then it may be required in order to uh, manifest an intention to maintain control. So for example, if uh, you take your car to the airport long-term parking lot uh, and forget to lock the door, uh, it may be in some sense, uh, you were clearly in possession of the car before you got to the airport. Uh, in some sense, it may be that your control is rather weak at that point, but you've clearly manifested an intention uh, to continue to possess the car in the future. Uh, and so the degree of control uh, to do that is, is less than would be the case uh, uh, in terms of establishing original possession. Um, uh, the, other, the other provision that we discuss uh, in this um, uh, set of materials is the right to possession. Uh, right to possession is, uh, and, and here we engage in a bit of streamlining, which I think is, is useful. Uh, if you read legal decisions, um, about possession, you'll find all sorts of curious uh, terminology uh, like constructive possession, legal possession, factual possession, imputed possession, and so on and so forth. And we think this is kind of confusing um, uh, and not very helpful. Uh, and so we've tried to divide the world up here. Uh, point, there, there's some other variations, in the mater not the materials you're not given, but divide up the world between possession uh, and the right to possession. And the right to possession exists when somebody uh, legally speaking, has a superior right to possession uh, relative to some other claimant. Clearest case of that would be someone who's an owner of property who happens to be not in possession, uh, but then uh, is displaced from possession or never enters into possession uh, and wants to assert the right to possess relative to whoever is in possession at that particular point in time. Uh, other illustrations are simply when you have a series of possessors, say a bunch of individuals sequentially find a lost piece of property or, or uh, otherwise acquire uh, possession over an unclaimed resource. Uh, and the law is quite clear in those contexts that the first possessor has superior rights relative to the second possessor and so forth. So right to possession uh, is critical. It's, it's a very important concept, again, in, in, the, in the property torts because quite frequently uh, the law indicates that persons that have an immediate right to possession 
even if they're not actually in possession, have standing to sue uh, for some of the property towards most clearly for, for perhaps a conversion. Um, uh, so um, uh, we uh, have sort of grouped things in terms of possession and right to possession and an attempt throughout the materials to avoid, if possible, terms like constructive possession, factual possession, legal possession, and so forth. With that, I guess I'll turn it over to John Goldberg to talk about trespass. Great. Uh, thanks, Tom, and thanks, Henry. Um, uh, I'm just going to briefly overview uh, some of the provisions in on trespass to land in the tentative draft. Um, uh, I want to say at the outset that the property torts provisions that will ultimately be included in this restatement, including provisions on trespass to land, uh, conversion. The plan is for these also to serve as uh, parallel provisions of the third restatement of torts, which makes sense given that these uh, all, are all standing at the intersection of the two fields. Um, uh, these provisions on trespass to land um, lay out uh, the basic elements of the tort, which are uh, very familiar and yet uh, uh, remain elusive uh, low these many years later. Uh, so, uh, of course, the basic idea is uh, an intentional uh, entry or causing uh, of entry of a thing or a person onto land in the possession of another. And as Tom was just emphasizing, um, uh, uh, the, the tort is fundamentally about um, interfering with uh, possession, uh, either right of possession or actual possession. Um, uh, and so uh, not only does the uh, black letter lay out an elements style definition, which looks like uh, element definitions of other torts you would find elsewhere uh, for in the third restatement of torts, uh, also in the commentary is provided a, a complementary, if you will, gist definition. Uh, and the idea here is to um, convey clearly that the elements of the tort what it prohibits, the intentional uh, entering uh, onto land or remaining on land are in the service of protecting the possessor's interest in exclusive possession uh, in the particular manner of uh, prohibiting unauthorized intentional physical intrusion. So uh, uh, 1.1 black letter and comments uh, of the trespass provisions aim to both capture the elements of the tort and the sort of gist uh, uh, or, or kind of uh, underlying purpose or structure of the tort. Um, other uh, comments to section 1.1 and, and other uh, black letter provisions cover a range of basic questions having to do with the scope of the trespass tort. Um, so as Tom mentioned, uh, there's a discussion both in commentary to 1.1 and in the black letter of section 1.3 uh, to uh, what sort of possessory interest uh, a person needs to have in order to serve, if you will, have standing uh, to, to bring a trespass claim here. The familiar point is that um, uh, one who has no possessory interest in a property, even if they're affected, by a physical intrusion on someone else's property uh, has no standing to sue for trespass. And these sections elaborate on that basic idea. Uh, a second component of the uh, definition uh, in 1.1 that is also elaborated uh, in a later provision, section 1.4, concerns uh, the absence of any harm or damage requirement to the tort of trespass. Familiarly, trespass does not require uh, as part of the prima facie case, proof that the physical entry by the uh, trespasser has caused some sort of physical or structural damage uh, to the land in question. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the restatement uh, explains why that is the case and why that makes sense for this particular tort. And along the way also talks about the kinds of consequential damages that are recoverable once the requisite intrusion has incurred. And uh, of course, when we get to uh, heads of damages and compensable damages, property damage is uh, recoverable. Uh, it's just that it's not an element of the tort per se. Um, uh, we also deal uh, in this draft with the uh, intent requirement of the tort, uh, which is a subject of a separate provision 1.5. Uh, this is quite tricky as it turns out, uh, because uh, the intent required for trespass uh, is in some ways distinct from the kind of intent that's required for other so-called intentional torts, such as battery, 
or assault. And so the draft tries uh, as much as possible to clarify precisely what is uh, and is not required uh, by the fact that trespass is uh, an intent, quote unquote, intentional tort. Um, a couple of other items that um, are covered include uh, what the uh, restatement here refers to as the so-called tangibility requirement. That is, uh, trespass uh, historically and conceptually has always been about physical intrusions onto land, and that's part of what distinguishes the scope of trespass liability from the scope of nuisance liability. And there's been um, considerable attention, uh, both in scholarship and some attention in the courts as to what counts as a tangible or physical intrusion. And uh, uh, this draft discusses that issue at some length. Uh, finally, uh, uh, this draft uh, discusses um, what we term quote unquote, secondary trespass liability. That is circumstances under which one can be held liable in trespass for directing or ordering another person to enter land uh, in a third party's possession. Uh, so all of those uh, are covered in this draft. Uh, in future drafts, uh, uh, we will include a separate provision specifically addressing um, the special case of above surface and below surface trespasses, uh, which have become uh, more important in the era of uh, drone, low level drone overflights. And so that will be coming in a separate provision, not included in these provisions. Uh, we will also be providing extensive treatments uh, of the most important privileges or defenses to trespass, including of course, permission or consent, as well as other provisions such as public and private necessity, but those are all coming in the future. So that's a brief overview of the trespass provisions and I'll now turn things over to uh, uh, Chris to talk about bailments. So this is the first time that the uh, restatement has attempted to have an entire chapter on bailment. Um, for those of you who haven't heard the term since law school or perhaps not even then, I'll give a brief overview of uh, what bailment is. Um, as we define it in the, in the uh, section that we've submitted here, uh, bailment is a legal relation that that arises whenever one person takes possession rightfully without committing a tort of personal property that's owned by another person. Um, that gives rise to a host of, of interesting questions. If I uh, am the owner of property, but you have possession of it, um, what exactly are our respective rights and obligations with regard to each other? Under what circumstances can you take possession of my property without becoming a trespasser or a converter or perhaps being liable for negligence? Um, what, you know, what obligations do you have? What's, uh, what's the scope of the privilege that you have to make use of the property while you have it, which will depend on the purpose behind the bailment? So we have, um, submitted an entire chapter on all of these topics to the council. Um, at this point, and I'm sure you'll be seeing, uh, we'll be bringing many of those uh, sections to the membership, I think, in the near future. For this initial uh, presentation, we've chosen to um, only focus on the first two sections of the bailment chapter. Um, and we did that because they sort of dovetail nicely with the basic uh, framework that um, Tom was presenting earlier in this presentation. Um, there's been sort of a, uh, a longstanding dispute, you might say, uh, among, or at least a difference of opinion among different lines of reasoning um, over time with how to characterize bailment. That's one of the things that makes it a little bit uh, interesting to, to think and write about. There's, it sort of sits at the intersection between property and contract and bailment is often referred to as a sort of contract. Um, for reasons that we discuss in, you know, in the draft and in the reporter's notes, um, we think that the, uh, the line of authority that views bailment fundamentally as not a species of contract, but rather a property relation that is uh, frequently modified by contract. We think that's the better way to think about it. And what that does is it makes, rather than some sort of meeting of the minds, a contractual understanding as the, uh, the uh, creative trigger for bringing a bailment into existence. Rather, the way that we're um, suggesting we should think about bailment is that it takes place anytime you take possession, possession of property that you recognize as actually being owned by someone else, someone other than yourself. 
so what that means is that all of those, the definitions uh, that uh, Tom was talking about with regard to possession actually have a lot of work to do. In a certain sense, the realm of bailment scenarios is where a lot of the, the uh, rubber hits the road with regard to actually trying to apply that definition that Tom laid out. Um, and so bailment, you know, requires us to think about, well, what does it mean to manifest the intent to main control, maintain control of something to the exclusion of others, and yet at the same time not be claiming that you own it. Um, and so what, what's going on in these first two sections is we're sort of trying to, um, to explain conceptually the basic um, category of what the bailment relation is. Um, and it has to do a lot with parsing out and uh, looking at scenarios in which some of those elements of what Tom was talking about do or do not apply. So just to make this a little bit clearer by giving some examples, right? You could think of a sort of a spectrum of cases in which there's relationships between you and property owned by someone else. Think about the case, for example, if uh, I go and park my car in a parking lot. Um, and then the first question is going to arise, well, is that a bailment? Is the parking lot now in exclusive possession of my car? Um, and here's where we have to distinguish between effective control, which as Tom pointed out is one of the elements of possession. We have to distinguish between effective control over a piece of personal property and effective control over a piece of real property. Um, and we do make a distinction between those two. And so we say that even though somebody may own the parking lot and have be in possession of it and therefore have exclusive control over it, that doesn't automatically mean that they have taken on or are exercising exclusive control over every object that's situated on that real property. So if I leave my car and I go away and I take my keys, we generally don't say that that parking lot is a bailee. On the other hand, you can easily tweak the uh, scenario and get to a point where it does start to look like the parking lot owner has taken possession. If they're a valet and they've taken custody of the keys, um, if they've now made it so that I no longer am able to get up and access my car without going through them and getting their permission to access the lot, then it might start to look more like they're exercising effective control. Now, even if you have effective control, however, as Tom pointed out, it's not merely effective control that gives rise to possession. You also need to be doing it exclusively, both with the you know, ability and the effect and the intent of excluding others. So that gets you into distinguishing situations. Say, for example, I'm at a dinner party and I'm using the host's silverware. I've probably got effective control over it. And even while the moment I'm using it, I might be exercising that control to the exclusion of the other diners and even the host. But that's where we would say, well, but you don't have the sort of intent that would uh, put you in exclusive possession. You don't intend to be um, exercising a control that, that's independent of the supervision and permission of the host who's in your presence, right? So we have to draw those lines. The other possible example would be, what if somebody leaves something on your real property that you uh, that are in the position of having to pick up and dispose of so that it won't be obstructing you? You exercise effective control, but you might have no interest in uh, maintaining that control to the exclusion of others. You're merely trying to move it out of your way and get rid of it. So I'm just giving you the, these basic ideas to give you a flavor of what sorts of problems we're dealing with in these initial two sections. We have a lot of illustrations and explanations. Um, and all we're doing here is really setting the table to, to use the definition of possession in such a way as to usefully cabin the, the types of relationships in which bailment issues will come to the fore. And then um, in the many other sections, which we'll be bringing to the membership, I think in the near future, we start to deal with, all right, if you are a Bailey, because you do have exclusive possession, what follows from that? What are the rights and duties that follow from that? Under what circumstances can you take exclusive possession and be a Bailey rather than a converter or a trespasser? Uh, those are some of the many interesting issues that uh, you'll be hearing from us in the near future on with regard to bailment. I will just say um, thank you for listening. Um, we hope that we'll be able to meet in person uh, before long, and we definitely value feedback on these initial attempts to, uh, to sort of lay out and tie some of these concepts together. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you, uh, John and Tom. And uh, thank you all uh, uh, listeners out there for listening. And we definitely look forward to your comments and to eventually seeing you in person. So goodbye.